When most people are asked about what they know about ancient philosophy, if anything, Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle are probably the common answers they would give. But the truth is, theirs was not the only school of thought in the ancient world, and one could argue that at various times, other schools of thought were as influential, if not more. One of these schools was Stoicism. Today, the term Stoic conjures to mind someone who is emotionless, cold, or stone-like in their reaction to anything. But this is only a shallow understanding, or even a misunderstanding, of Stoicism. In reality, Stoicism is a philosophy for those who wish to live a better life. Its founder, Zeno, believed the purpose of philosophy was to find a smooth flow to life, where what we do is in harmony with our guiding spirit and the will of the one who governs the universe. Seen another way, living in harmony with reason and nature. The most well-known Stoic to we moderns is Marcus Aurelius, the philosopher emperor whose meditations are still on bookshelves around the world. The reason for this is that the ideas he expressed are timeless, and touch so directly on the human condition that they are just as relevant today as when he wrote them. Interestingly, he never meant for them to be published. Rather, they were notes he wrote to remind himself how to lead a virtuous life aligned with the Stoic principles. Of these, the four cardinal ones were wisdom, fortitude, courage, and temperance. But while Marcus Aurelius is the best known, it's the lesser known Stoic philosophers who laid the foundation and paved the way for this incredible way of looking at life. Today on Totally Awesome History, the early Stoics. Ancient insight for modern times. Stoicism was founded in the 4th century BC by a man whose livelihood in dye trading ended abruptly in the form of a shipwreck. His name was Zeno of Citium. Later, he would look back on this unfortunate event as one of the best things that happened to him. Why? Because it steered him to philosophy. In Athens, he would come to teach what became Stoicism on a porch. And this is how Stoicism got its name because where he taught came to be known as the Stoa Poikla, or the Painted Porch. There's something homey and humble about founding a school of philosophy on a porch, as if it were made for everyone alike, which is what Stoicism was and is all about. This sense of humility and practicality can also be seen in Zeno's immediate successor, Cleanthes, whose nickname came to be Waterboy. The reason for this is because throughout his career as a philosopher, he earned his living by carrying water and performing other odd jobs that needed doing in Athens. It's quite a different image of philosophers than what we have today. Instead of a tenured professor, imagine your gardener or pool boy turning out to be a well-respected philosopher. Of course, considering the high unemployment or underemployment rates of philosophy graduates these days, it might not be so surprising. Other early Stoic philosophers developed metaphors for life and living that are also useful for today. Cleanthes' successor, Chrysippus, said that in the race of life, he who is running a race ought to endeavor and strive to do the utmost of his ability to come off victor. But it is utterly wrong for him to trip up his competitor or to push him aside. So, in life it is not unfair for one to seek for himself what may accrue to his benefit, but it is not right to take it from another. In other words, do what you can to succeed, but play fair. Imagine a world where more people had that attitude. A later leader of the Stoics named Antipater saw archery as the best metaphor for the virtuous life. We can train and practice to be the best archer we can possibly be, but when it comes time to draw the bow and loose the arrow, there are factors outside of our control that can influence whether we hit our mark. The important thing to remember is that we need to learn to accept what we can't change and that our worth should not be tied up and whether we hit the bullseye or miss altogether. The idea of not placing our worth in our relative levels of success or failure is one that we see in the concept of unconditional self, life, and other acceptance as described by Dr. Albert Ellis, the founder of a modern day form of therapy called Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy, REBT, and Influencer on Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, CBT. 
Unconditional self-acceptance holds that each of us has intrinsic value as a human, and that there are no good or bad people, only people who do good or bad things. Ideally, this allows us to not puff ourselves up when we accomplish something great, and not put ourselves down when we make mistakes, being the fallible human beings we are. Likewise, we can extend this to others and life in general. Things will happen in life that we have no control over, and we can either accept them or insist that life is unfair and make ourselves miserable. As Ellis says in The Myth of Self-Esteem, Unconditional acceptance means liking yourself, others, and the world when you are not getting what you want and in spite of getting what you don't want. Antipater and the ancient Stoics would agree. Another Stoic, Panateus, who was a confidant and an advisor to one of the Roman Republic's greatest generals, Scipio Emilianus, saw life as a more aggressive and violent affair. As a result, he believed that the best way to understand the demands of a virtuous life was through the Pancratist, a type of ancient Greek MMA fighter. The Roman author Aulus Gellius tells us that in Panateus' book On Duties, he says, the life of men, he says, who pass their time in the midst of affairs and who wish to be helpful to themselves and to others is exposed to constant and almost daily troubles and sudden dangers. To guard against these and avoid these, one needs a mind that is always ready and alert, such as the athletes have who are called pancreatists. For just as they, when called to the contest, stand with their arms raised and stretched out, and protect their head and face by opposing their hands as a rampart, and as all their limbs, before the battle has begun, are ready to avoid or deal blows, so the spirit and mind of the wise man, on the watch everywhere and at all times, against violence and wanton injuries, ought to be alert, ready, strongly protected, prepared in time of trouble, never flagging in attention, never relaxing its watchfulness, opposing judgment and forethought like arms and hands to the strokes of fortune and the snares of the wicked, lest in any way a hostile and sudden onslaught be made upon us when we are unprepared and unprotected." Apart from their writings and metaphors, the early Stoics were also known for how they responded to hardship, something that is quintessentially Stoic. Several of them, due to their adherence to doing the right thing all the time, found themselves on the outs with the powers that be. One such Stoic who endured exile in his life was Epictetus. According to the Christian writer Origen, in his own day, Epictetus was more popular than Plato was in his. And for good reason. Unlike most other Stoics and philosophers in general, Epictetus was not a member of the wealthy elite. Quite the opposite. He began life as a slave and a slave with a cruel master, no less. There is one story where, for some reason, his master, Epaphroditus, began twisting his leg. Epictetus calmly warned him that his leg would break if he went too far. Sure enough, it did. Epictetus simply said, there, did I not tell you that it would break? Apparently, he had a high pain threshold as well. And from that time, he was lame. However, even in response to walking with a limp his whole life, he would say that while his lameness was an impediment to his leg, it wasn't to his will. At the core of Epictetus' Stoicism was the idea that we should identify what is under our control and what isn't. Once we've made that distinction, we should work on what is under our control and accept the rest. This idea would later be echoed and popularized in the Serenity Prayer, written in 1932-33 by Reinhold Neighbor, and which is often used in 12-step recovery programs. The most quoted version of the prayer goes, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Further, he believed that when we become upset about something, it isn't the thing itself that upsets us, but rather our beliefs and opinions about it. And this is something we see in Albert Ellis's REBT nearly 2,000 years later. In How to Stubbornly Refuse to Make Yourself Miserable About Anything, Yes Anything, while Ellis tells us that REBT isn't pure Stoicism, it agrees with Epictetus. You largely, not entirely, create your own misery. More specifically, he's referring to our irrational beliefs that make us interpret incidents and events, well, 
irrationally. Likewise, in the modern treatment of OCD, there is a form of cognitive behavioral therapy called exposure and response prevention, ERP, where the sufferer exposes him or herself to the source of their anxious obsession on purpose and then purposefully refrains from engaging in whatever compulsion they have, whether it's checking, counting, ruminating, or whatever. This is designed to allow the brain to become habituated to the feared scenario and thus, over time, lower the levels of anxiety associated with it. In short, rather than running away from one's fears, ERP says to run toward them. Remarkably, this is something that Epictetus caught on to way back then. At some point after being freed, he adopted a son, and since it's every parent's worst fear that something should happen to their child, Marcus Aurelius tells us that Epictetus said, as you kiss your son goodnight, whisper to yourself, he may be dead in the morning. This may sound macabre, but if you look at it in such a way that he is habituating himself to even the worst things happening in life, then he wouldn't be hobbled if they did. And this is unconditional life acceptance at its finest. There were dozens of other notable Stoics before Marcus Aurelius that are worthy of mention, too many to fit into one video. Cato and Seneca easily come to mind. There are even more Stoic concepts that came before and influenced his thinking and those after. One of these is that we are all here as players on a stage and that our duty is to play our part as best as we can. Sound familiar? What is important is not just to acknowledge the contributions the Stoics made to ancient philosophy, but also to our own ways of thinking. Their pragmatism has echoed down through the ages and can even help us set out to accomplish what Zeno's goal was, to find a smooth flow to life. And for that reason, the Stoics of the ancient world are part of totally awesome history.